Today we have a pretty cool episode because we're going to be talking about a football club that is widely considered to be the world's greenest football club. So it's hundred percent green energy, which which powers the entire stadium. The football kit that they wear was made fully of recycled plastic and coffee grounds. Then in twenty fifteen they became. the world's first all vegan football team the stadium's going to be made with pure wood now they call it sustainable timber and this is where it becomes a bit you know murky because sustainable timber timber is nothing it's just wood that you cut down and then you're just like oh i'm it's sustainable because i'm growing another one this is on the end of the project this is a long term project for you know uh, for uh, wait what's the team symbol green forest, forest rovers? green rovers Forest Green Rovers. There we go. What is kind of the harsh reality is Green Forest Rovers had kind of Forest happy. Green Krishna. <laughs> forest Green Rovers. <laughs> It's F G R. It's F G R. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of All About Sports, the podcast, a podcast by the fans for the fans. Today you're joined by two of your co-hosts, myself Rishab, as well as Mazar. Hi, everyone. And today we have a pretty cool episode because we're going to be talking about a club, a football club, that is widely considered to be the world's greenest football club, which is the Forest Green Rovers. If you know about them, if you don't, great. We're going to give you all the details. If you think you know about them, we're probably going to give you more detail than you've known from before. Um, before we get into this week's episode. A quick, quick reminder of last week's episode. We talked all about paddle. For those of you who are based in India, for those of you not based in India, it's a small variation of pickleball, or vice versa. Maybe pickleball is a variation of paddle. We talk about a little bit about its history as well as the likelihood of is it going to be keep being a sport? It's grown massively in recent years. Can it continue to sustain that growth? Will it continue to have the popularity that it has currently? So, with that, Maz, let's get into this week's episode. all about forest green rovers like i mentioned for a little bit of context they're a professional football club that's based in england specifically in gloucestershire they're a team that competes in league 2 last season they actually were good enough to make it up to league 1 uh, so they got promoted in 2021 2022 so 2022 2023 they played in league 1 unfortunately got relegated back to league 2 which is where they're playing this season they are kind of you know left at the bottom at the moment at the moment that we are recording that 22nd of 23 teams which is admittedly not great but a little bit about we're not going to focus too much on the footballing side we're going to talk a lot more about the sustainability of this club for context they are considered the world's greenest football club by fifa this was a statement they made in 2017 they were founded in 1889 they have a chairman named dale vins who's kind of been at the center of a lot of this uh this green revolution which mazar will get into and they are a 100% vegan club so everything served at the stadium is vegan and they are in the process of they currently have a green stadium which is the new lawn but they're also working to build a completely new stadium called the eco park that's supposed to be a new sustainable green stadium mazar who has studied sports at a masters level and done sports management at a masters level has done a bit more digging in and research into this so We're going to throw a lot of the questions to you, Mus, because you have far more detail on this than I do. To start off, Mus, tell us a little bit about this football club and where they came from. But more specifically, when did this switch happen? When did this green revolution start? When did they start down this road of sustainability? Yeah, so Krishna, Forest Green has been a club that is like pretty much any English football club, right? Very proud of. their team very proud of where they come from very proud of their culture and so on and so forth there was nothing unique about forest green rovers until 2010 when dale wins took over when he basically bailed forest green out from bankruptcy it was in 2010 when dale wins took over as forest green's chairman and just for all of those who don't know dale wins is the owner of a company called ecotricity now ecotricity happens to be britain's greenest energy company so no surprise and the name made sense and it fit so he went ahead with it and it happened to be his passion projects now of course you have to be differently wired uh, with all due respect 
to be able to push whatever agendas you have through, especially at a football club level, especially in England where the culture of football is all about beer and burgers and basically eating pies as well. So, and may, obviously it's going to be meat pies. I'm not talking about apple pies here. So, Our English fans are going to love this. The few that we would, however many we But have. it's true. It's true. We've all been a part of that culture. Not we've all. I have been a part of that culture and I love it. Don't get me wrong. I don't think how much I would sign up for this green revolution. With all due respect, sustainability is great. But that vegan stuff troubles me a bit. But, but uh, anyway, jokes apart. He basically is the major owner of Forest Green Rovers through Ecotricity as well because he just made Ecotricity the principal and majority sponsor. Uh, so that's how it all started in 2010. Uh, so basically, after he took over, he started deciding that, okay, I'm going to go aggressive on this and go in and make big moves. So in February of 2011... He ended up banning the sale of meat at the stadium. So there was obviously backlash back then. It was 2011. That time was still very early days for the vegan movement to come in and people being so focused on uh, the vegan diets. Yes, vegetarianism had kicked in significantly by then. Um, especially Peter's movements and all of that really came to the fore uh, towards the, the late 2000s. Let's say, if that's the right term for it. Basically, just before 2010s, the 2010 time. <laughs> uh, but but the point was, so basically, that's why it was an, a radical approach. People loved him for it. People hated him for it. Of course, there's you no, know, you can't satisfy everyone. And Krishna, we've discussed this on our podcast so many times. He didn't care. He knew he was doing the right thing according to him. So he went for it. And like I said, he has this eccentricity to him. I've done a full study on Dale Vince himself. So I can tell a, tell you all about what type of a person he was, what type of a leader he was. He followed this, he follows this individual, sorry for my me rolling my words. The individualistic approach is what he took in terms of leadership. Uh, so that had a massive role to play. And what happened was he was also very cautious of how he did this. So he didn't just straight away ban the meat sales. He just moved to leaving vegetarian products and free range poultry. There was fish as well at the beginning. And the fish was also from sustainable stocks only. So they, he was very careful of how he went about it because he knew that meat is an essential aspect at, and now obviously people have broken those busted those myths with the likes of Virat Kohli and Novak Djokovic being at the highest level in their performance the biggest examples I can think of at the top of my head in terms of being absolute pro-vegan people and pro-vegan athletes still winning it all so I think Chris Paul also might be vegan. I vaguely remember some this coming up somewhere. I said winning it all, Krishnan. And you know my thoughts about Chris Paul. Are you trying to trigger me right now? That's exactly what I'm doing. Any chance I get to mention Chris Paul to you, I do, Mars. Because I just know I'll get such a visceral reaction. You know, sometimes I puke within when I hear his name. I just... I believe it. I believe it from every time I've mentioned Chris Paul. I, need, I think I need to make a phone call to Rajon Rondo right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so coming back to it. So he started with that. So he was very calculated in his approach as well. Then I think it was in June 2011 where he started moving to. I mean, the movement had already started. And then officially in 2011 of June, uh, they managed to create the world's first organic pitch. Uh, so that was a massive step. And to think of that is crazy, right? The other thing he did in 2011, this was towards the end of the year, was that he installed solar panels across the stadium. So all the electricity started coming, the lighting and everything that they needed came from their solar panels eventually. Then in 2012, he moved on to a robot lawnmower. Then in 2015, officially, they became 
the world's first all vegan football team so it still took him 6 years to transition that out sorry 4 years to transition that out from the time when he started banning products and moved on from the red meat red meat was the biggest step first and then it eventually made it all vegan so he was very careful of how he did it as well and let's be clear the players are not restrict, restricted from eating meat they can eat it they just won't get it at the stadium they won't get it at the training ground they can eat it at home and whatever but it's just so happened because if you spend so much time with the football club right you will end up eating all of that and if that becomes your diet as well it becomes very hard for you to then even take that meat or be able to eat that meat because it's upsetting for your stomach then so it's a uh, smart tail it wins is- knew what he was doing <laughs> and i like what you talked about much there is there is kind of a gradual process you have to go through to win over both your fans as well as the team to make them believe hey it's possible to do this because i think especially in, at you know initially when vegan movements were becoming popular most athletes were typically against it because they're like you know there's no way we're going to get enough protein there's no way we can maintain the way the kind of physical um features that they need to to be a good athlete while still eating a vegan diet but i think more and more we're starting to see both teams and clubs and players finding ways to do it again it does seem oftentimes a little bit, bit more costly in this case dale wins is funding it so as long as you have that it's probably more of an option but exactly so just to add to what you said krishna so the green energy that they get right the reason why they are so sustainable is because that's coming from ecotricity so that's purely dale wins again so it's 100% green energy which which powers the entire stadium so that's a big difference maker as well another thing is their grass the organic pitch is sustainable is one thing but it's pesticide free as well so they're very careful of that so it you're even more amazed at how are they maintaining it so well and the one final thing is if yes 2017 was when they were officially recognized as the world's greenest football club but what they did in 2021 was revolutionary the football kit that they wear the jerseys that they wear well one of them was made fully of recycled plastic and coffee grounds so it just tells you that there are, if there's a will there is a way and they did it yes it was extremely expensive they were selling those jerseys also for around 110 or 100 120 quid which is i mean but that's the it's it's slightly higher uh, than the price of a normal jersey but well look at the material it's really interesting i honestly had i i can't even imagine how you get from a to b sometimes with a lot of these renewable products i sometimes can't fully understand how a coffee ground can become a shirt but it's it's really phenomenal to hear and i love mas you kind of sharing the timeline because it's it's obviously not overnight but gradually dale wins has kind of you know picked up new things to kind of hit on so we've gone up to 2021 mas this is on the end of the project this is a long term project for dale wins is a long term project for you know uh, for uh, wait what's the team's name was green forest, forest rovers? green rovers forest green rovers there we go wow this is a kind of complete brain fart <laughs> forest green rovers um this is obviously a long term project for the forest green rovers what are the plans going forward you've talked we've gone all the way to 2021 what are things that you know some more milestones they have down the line that they're trying to hit to keep this progress going so krishna you actually touched upon a couple uh so you mentioned that their vision is inspiring sustainable change that vision is not the football club's vision that is forest green as an organization's vision to to sort of support their community and their strategic plan in growing their community which ties into the second aspect which uh, is from their long term pers- uh, perspective which you, again you had touched upon the eco park which is their new stadium now what they're trying to do with this new stadium is build an entire community in gloucester that is sustainable so they want to make it a cyclable sort of circuit around a park built around it as well full greenery uh, they'll use the sustainable wood 
the sustainable timber that they, they'll use the trees that they're growing for all from all the cutting. The stadium's going to be made with pure wood. Now they call it sustainable timber, and this is where it becomes a bit, you know, murky. Because sustainable timber timber is nothing. It's just wood that you cut down and then you are you're just like, oh, I'm it's sustainable because I'm growing another one. What they aren't accounting for is the time lost in that tree growing was versus the next tree that will grow. So uh from the felling, so there's deforestation for that whatever those five to ten years. By the time the trees actually grow to a decent a uh, sustainable height and uh, where the soil doesn't get eroded because there will be that and then animal grazing increases in deforested land and all of those things anyway i'm going science on someone who was better th- than me at science uh but <laughs> uh, i don't remember the science much we need this recap i don't remember any of this <laughs> no but the point is so what they've done is they set up five year plans which is their strategic community building program so the last plan that they set up was from 2018 to 2023 we're in 2023 so it's coming to an end so they will be they will have already planned it out but they haven't officially released it or maybe they haven't and forgive me for that because i haven't seen it but what they aim to do is to use obviously use all the resources they have efficiently no sort of wastage and have everyone within the gloster community to be responsible and feel like they play a part in this for them forest green rovers is more than a football club and that's what they want to build they wanted to be a full family they want forest green to be the advocates for gloster they want to be leading as an example and send a message out to the rest of the uk first and obviously then to the rest of the world on everything is possible with support of in, if everyone takes individual responsibility and that's what they're trying to do so they're always trying to just improve on all of those aspects uh they've taken a lot of pride in being called the greenest football club in the world so after that they've started launching a lot of the sport and recreation programs as well as health and well-being programs within that area as well so it goes way beyond football what they are trying to do because they realize that the moment you get someone will involved and they have that sense of community everyone buys into whatever ideologies you have we've seen that work in the past for the wrong reasons and if delvins can do that for the right reasons then why not so that is what they are focusing on it starts off with local then they want to grow it to regional and then eventually national and what they're trying to tell the national aspect like i touched upon the uk was it's a need because of where we are going in terms of like climate change and all of that if you believe in it uh for those who do he, that's what he's trying to say we require it and if we don't act now we will be in trouble and they are like we're doing our best join us or at least try to emulate what we are doing we're not doing this to make profits we're not doing this to show it to anyone we're doing it because we genuinely get that's the the entire thing that they've thought of oh, i love it and i think that's exactly what i think other clubs sometimes need you know you, you think about other green companies you say like a tesla you know what they've done and you can love you can love or hate the company that's not what i'm getting into but the fact that they made the car that they did now every single company almost has this blueprint of oh we know evs are a it's something that we can create a great car with b we've realized there is a demand for it the demand exists and i think that's what forest green rovers is doing for football is saying no 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 it's not this like alien concept that we can't figure out in the context of a football club we can do it it's going to take time to scale it it's going to take time to do it for different you know for different size clubs but i love that they're creating sort of the blueprint progressively to do something that's really just not been done in the football world or frankly most stadiums across sports it's not a common It's not a common experience. Mas is a random question. I just thought of it. What is Gloucester like as a city? Is it a because I guess one of the concerns is you know you look at a, say a London or a Manchester or a Leeds or something like that. They're pretty well built cities already. So the ability to alter or change infrastructure is relatively limited. 
do you have an idea on what like, is gloucester a town is it a big city how much pre existing infrastructure is this like a place in the middle of nowhere i i've heard the term gloucestershire i've heard the term gloucester i have no idea what that town or city is about do you have any idea yeah so of course krishna so gloucester is in the west of england it is a city gloucester is a city which exists in the county called gloucestershire so that is basically the structure of it and it's a very small county it's not massive uh, and it's very close to like i mean there's no point in me telling you all of that also but basically yeah it's just the west of england it's it's not too close to london but we all know how big the uk is so uh, it's not far either it's i think it's like a 2 hour drive from london to get to gloucester to 2 and a half hours maybe 2 and a half hours i think so it's just a small town with the typical a countryside british folks who just love their lives and who basically only come to london maybe to work otherwise would always go back to gloucester uh, and spend their lives there so it's a very small uh, tightly knit community the reason why i know so much about gloucester is because one of my great professors professor tony gay is from there and he told me a lot and so is one of my really good friends sam berry shout out to you he's from there as well and they have a darn good rugby team so that's all i know about gloucester and of course uh, forest green is at the center of all, all of that perfect it's 10 more facts than i knew about them currently but i did while you were talking quickly look up um quickly look up a little bit about gloucestershire and entire county so not even just the city just the entire county of gloucestershire is 900000 or so population when it was you know polled in like the last i think census is from 2021 so obviously not a, a not a huge place but i the reason i wanted to kind of bring it up is just setting some context of you know where the place is based because i sometimes think when you don't have some pre existing infrastructure it's easier to build something new it's easier to start from scratch so I feel like that context might potentially be helpful. With then much so I was looking a little bit about you know Dale Vince. Dale Vince is of course a millionaire. He is a multi-millionaire. I think he's about 100 like I was looking at his net worth as much as you can trust these net worths on Google but let's say we do. He's like a 100 millionaire which is obviously very rich but in the context of sports owners not crazy. We're just used to a lot of billionaire sports owners if I'm being very honest. So he's not one of the richest sports owners um you know in in the history of sport by any means. and and at the end of the day he is a businessman like let's be honest i think anyone who even if you care about environment uh, environmental work i think you have to be sensible enough to know if there isn't a business for your product if there isn't a demand to sustainably grow this over a period of time it doesn't matter how good the mission is your product will not get sold whether it's a whether it's a product whether it's a football club whether it's a whether it's a bar of chocolate at the end of the day demand needs to exist so what are the ways in which they sort of managing You've talked a lot about you know they're bringing community in to get them excited about the club from a cost perspective. Are there any things? I think you started to you know hit on this earlier in the conversation as well. What are some of the ways that they're managing costs? Because you said you know some of the things are kind of expensive front end costs. How are they keeping costs in check for profits in the long term? Yeah, so like I said, Krishna, it's always expensive to set up sustainable methods. Let's face it. uh it's a very cost intensive process because it's demand versus supply right uh, at the end of the day so and always to like get the good stuff it's always more expensive as simple as that he's borne a lot of that cost and let's face it uh the energy is the biggest thing when you look at uh sustainable numbers as well you look at tonnage electricity uh, electricity and travel those two aspects will be the highest uh in terms of leaving a carbon footprint he's eliminated that completely thanks to ecotricity ecotricity is not a massive company big uh, for nothing right like they're huge for a reason they are green for a reason they're the biggest green energy company and he's been doing this for years let's not forget that as well so he's just basically using that so he's carrying a bulk of that cost that's why they are able to sustain themselves so he's basically writing off all of that money so we don't know how much it is 
we don't know how what are those costs so so that's why they're able to sustain themselves a lot of credit goes to him on why they are able to sustain themselves but from a long term perspective as well when you have solar panels installed you're not paying as much for your electricity as well so you save cost there if you don't have to grow grass uh, in using pesticides you save cost for the pesticides you save cost through other ways you're not using water to water your uh, your pitches you're using rain water because you've harvested all that water so it's just a constant cycle of water and it's the uk it keeps raining so that's what they are managing to utilize so they're saving cost because they are self sustainable that's how they've managed to keep themselves afloat and haven't faced too many issues or faced too many losses in that sense so i think that's how they've been functioning honestly i would i i don't have the numbers to tell you exactly what it is because my focus throughout my research research was purely on the sustainability angle and what are they doing to be green and whether it is authentic or not whether they what they are trying to achieve is just a media play or was it authenticity and what i learned was yeah dale vince is one of those people who honestly deserves a nobel prize for all that he's done whether whether or not you believe in veganism whether whether or not you believe in climate change whether or not you believe in whatever all those aspects are the guy deserves credit for pushing and believing in his cause and being successful in his cause as well let's not forget there was success on the pitch krishna like you said the moment they made it to league 1 they was languishing down in league 3 and they they really had fought four or five golden seasons made it to league 1 then unfortunately now they're going through that rough patch again don't know what's gone wrong footballs for another day but another thing that prop also has helped them and i have to touch upon that is the sponsors their sponsorship tags so of course they've had all of their sponsors are in some way or form linked to sustainability or linked to the green revolution so they have a waste management company they've tied up with called grandin they have of course ecotricity they have their official kit partners also uh i forgot the name i think it's premier layer pl uh i can't remember what it stood for uh but basically they make their kits with 50% bamboo so they they're using uh then avoiding plastic usage there as well then corn which is a vegan food brand it's one of europe's leading vegan food brands then they've got an ev company they've tied up with uh, vegan dairy products uh wildlife support vegan hair products they have like a specialist building services company as well which they've tied up with because at the end of the day and delvin said this heating is important for football clubs to sustain themselves so how can you do it in the most sustainable manner and let's face it fgr is not even disagreeing and they're very authentic on where there are certain unsustainable methods but at the end of the day they've raised their hands and said till there's no alternative we can't help it we have to do it it doesn't mean we're going to fold our team now and stop here we'll figure it out down the line and that's what eesi and uh, fgr have been trying to do for a while now is trying to figure out heating systems that can be sustainable as well so these are just examples and that's where they get a lot of funding and support from as well so it's frankly in kind at the end of the day and uh, so and if they are happy and they don't need the profits they're paying their players handsomely enough troy dini is just joined them so clearly they're doing uh, well enough to be able to sustain themselves and till i think since they have taken over i, I this might be incorrect but it's it's pre 2017 they actually even went up from the national league so they they have gone up from the national league they are still in league 2 but they have gone up at least from uh from the national league so there is progress it, it, it is progress it is hard going up the tiers and going up the rungs in english football so uh that is that is really impressive and what i liked about the point that that you brought up is i think we generally have seen 
across organizations, there are a lot more coming in in terms of metrics that companies have for determining if they're a good from an ESG perspective, which is environmental, social, and governance perspective. Obviously, this focuses a lot on the environmental piece. And one of the challenges is how do you hold yourself accountable, right? These ESG metrics are currently very flubby. So uh, one of the biggest you know criticisms that oftentimes it gets is you know you see all these companies with great ESG metrics and maybe they are companies who aren't maybe the best uh, examples for one aspect but are doing really well on another aspect and so they're considered to be great companies overall. So I think it's really important, like you said, to hold yourself accountable and for them to say, hey, this is a thing that we've not changed our process on but we plan to in the long term what the issues are. I don't mean to lead us down a dark path, but with that in mind, I do want to get to this because I I don't think any story is perfect. And I think it wouldn't be just to not paint a wholesome, like a, a complete picture. Have there been any controversies, controversies must that this club has faced? Is there anything that has become newsworthy information and how have they dealt with it in the past? So Krishna, it's not ugly controversies as such and it's not necessarily been linked directly to the club either it's been the organizations that they've partnered with there is one thing which just troubles me which i'll come to on the last point one was there was a massive problem with corn foods which was one of europe's leading vegan food brands where they use this product called mycoprotein now mycoprotein is a type of fungus that causes illnesses typically so there was a time period where one of their products led to 4% of the consumers falling ill. 4%. And that's and and basically there was some adverse reaction, a reaction to this particular mycoprotein, uh, as it's called. Um, and there was massive backlash on it against FGR as well, because they were their main sponsors at the time, too. And that's sort of tarnished the rover's integrity at that point where everyone reacts right and it's always and always has a cascading effect so to speak they didn't do anything to tackle it and that was a bit worrisome but maybe they felt that you know what it's not a big deal or maybe they evaluated it and thought it was fine i don't know so had they come out officially and spoken about it and said hey we got it wrong or we didn't know would have been a different method but again not a massive massive issue when we're talking about like other clubs and 115 financial breaches Everton being docked 10 points as well so let's not go there I, I feel for Everton they were they were very supportive in trying to resolve the issues and they still got jacked those points so anyway coming to EESI now this is the next one the heating uh, company, they've been with the club since 1991, way before Dale Vince as well. And imagine if Dale Vince has not let them go, even after he took over, there must be something there. Which is why he's why I mentioned how important heating is for all of for a football club to sustain itself. And I would have never imagined that, though it makes complete sense. So they've tried to modernize their methods and follow more sustainable approaches and stuff like that. But from 1991 to 2023, nothing has changed, which just makes you question, is EESI really trying? And then it also makes you think that, come on, man, Ecotricity could have come in at some point and done something here, right? We're talking about the world, uh, Britain's leading green energy company and they can't figure out a way to try and support it. It's very different fields. I'm going to get into it. I'm not an engineer. I don't understand any of this. But the point is, it did raise a lot of questions. And there were a lot of things said back in 2015 as well around the legitimacy of uh, sports clubs and partnerships with such companies. Even with Ineos and, uh, and Formula One, there's been a lot raised around Mercedes, GP and that. So just another example. So FGR has also fallen prey to that. Uh, again, not a massive, massive issue, to be honest. Uh, but still something that I have to highlight because this club seems too good to be true after a point, Krishnan. <laughs> I think history has made us jaded, I think is what the, is what the truth Maybe. is. We're so nervous about something coming out the next day. 
exactly uh and yeah i think the one thing that does trouble me it's not a controversy but it's been bothering me and i already mentioned this earlier the sustainable timber what is that term why are you glorifying it you're cutting down trees just admit it and you're using it yes for good just call it what it is it's wood you're cutting it it's fine I mean, it's not fine, but you're doing it for like a long-term vision. You're trying to build a community, greenery. It's a beautiful project. And uh, we're going to put up that picture for all to see. Their model looks phenomenal. And I'd be like, I would love to be here every day. They wanted to create a natural ecosystem. Beautiful. Uh, but my worry is that time period between when they cut all those trees in what happens to that land by because those other trees will be grown somewhere else so i'm just a bit concerned about it takes so long for a tree to grow so that's my only sort of bothering factor because the eco park is a massive project massive and if you look at the size of it the entire layouts, the way they've planned everything, the entire structure, the way they want to build uh, certain things around to, for the community as well, not just the stadium, gets you worried about like, man, this is a massive plot of land just being used and lots of trees are going to be cut for this. Is it really worth it? However, what I will say is Dale Vince knows what he's doing typically. And that's why I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. And what's working for FGR is they've already built up a really good image of themselves where they can be forgiven if they do something wrong with this as well. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just tell just laying it out there on what it is. So I think these are the things. So no massive controversy as such that has come to the four uh, and good for them. Like, we spoke about this a little bit in our conversation about good and bad football owners, but I think fans are patient and willing to, you know, are willing to wait for changes to happen if they have some trust in the owner and their owner has proven themselves over a period of time. So it's not going to be a perfect journey. It's not, there are going to be hiccups that come up multiple times to this journey, but it is just exciting that they are paving a new road and creating something that just does, has not existed historically. But with that, Maz, I want to ask you a question, which is, I'm going to finish on this question, which I think is what everyone's question really is at the end of this is, where do we go from here? It's a great story. You love to hear it. But how does this thing get replicated across different clubs, across the globe? And is it even possible? Like, what is your opinion? It doesn't have to be a perfectly mathematical answer. Like you said, we're not the engineers. I don't know how to do the same thing in London, for example. There are way more complex pieces that go into it. But from an opinion perspective, what are your thoughts on this actually extending out to being not just in Gloucestershire? Okay, so I will first give you my... Uh, okay, let's do this. I will first tell you exactly... Uh, from a quote by Samuel that I had read, Samuel, some guy. Okay, I had done some research. I don't remember who. <laughs> I was wondering who the fuck is Samuel? Who, did you mention this guy before? <laughs> from Samuel. Okay, I get the point though. <laughs> okay, so Samuel A. Okay, so it was some macro marketing insights that I had read. This person, he spent a season with Forest Green Rovers around sustainability, and it was an orca research papers so great great insights and very reliable stuff so i'm just going to say what he said and i'm going to quote him here so what he had to say was could be she also i don't know sam is the surname actually uh but the world of soccer has firstly soccer so i discredited it there and then only but the world of football <laughs> that is a bad start man <laughs> It was just a joke. I had to get. I had to go there. Come on, we're talking about an English football club. We can't use soccer, okay? No, so, I agree okay. with you. No, I always agree with you. I think soccer is a bad start. I yeah, 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 yeah. So the world of football has had its ups and downs in history, but there is no doubt of its power to influence billions of people for good. Right? Forest Green Rovers has been showing that what a few could do 
to make things possible so so football as a fully sustainable sector is increasingly becoming free from climate change warning emissions and that is only not only realistic but a desirable future for fans and clubs alike what he's basically trying to get at is they have shown that it is doable forest green has shown that it is doable now the problem and this is where my opinion comes in is the rapid commercialization of football will not allow for it. or the rapid commercialization of sport in general will not allow for it. the only sport right now that i can foresee not only sport but a major sport that will be affected is going to be cricket and we've discussed this already as well if cricket does not do something soon enough to try and be more sustainable we're going to have trouble climate wise heat strokes floods lack of water for watering the pitches all of that could become an issue cricket needs to look into this massively even something that even some of the sea sports so your yachting sailing and all of that also have to worry about sustainability because there are like the more climate changes there's going to be more tsunamis bigger tides worse conditions for sailing so there's a lot of problems like that football shown that it's possible but the commercialization of football will never let it happen because if you go down this path the biggest money baggers are your oil companies your energy companies and that's where the problem lies if you don't get money from them and you go down this path no one's going to sponsor you it just it's a greedy world out there so realistically no club wants to do it because they won't get income they will not be able to potentially in their minds then they can't buy more players so success also falls short and they're too big to fail so they don't give a shit to be honest that's the problem massive respect to forest green for all they've done came up from the national leagues from like basically like semi pro level became a professional football team managed to sign a premier league striker in troy dini former premier league striker in troy dini so there's two ways to look at it it's all about at the end of the day it's about morality and with the leeches that own manchester united with the types of uh clubs ownership that exists otherwise also in other clubs with the likes of bayern munich and real madrid also so driven for success do they want to go down that path okay i will i will give credit where credit is due to two clubs in the premier league who have done been at least on the face of things been doing a good job not forest green good but good nonetheless both the north london clubs arsenal and spurs especially spurs in the way they set up the sustainability uh, uh, the sustainable uh, stadium impressive in terms of saving of water the water harvesting that they've done uh, just less wastage everything is better the heating facilities all of that great stuff uh arsenal being very conscious as well of sustainability i read a lovely report in fact they ranked first last season amongst all european clubs in in sustainability in the top obviously top flight let's be very clear uh, we know fgr's way ahead i think forest green just had like 42.7 tons of carbon footprints in 2021 that's it That's it. I don't even. I don't even want to talk about Forest Green. No, is I'm just going to clip the part where you said the clubs that have done a great job are the two North London clubs, Arsenal and Tottenham. When I'm going to use it without context in many, <laughs> many, many of our videos, that part is getting clipped for sure. <laughs> But Krishna, regardless, you guys have done a good job even on the football pitch. So I mean, clip it and do what you want with it because my club's not going anywhere. while these leeches exist it's not happening so yeah man that's man, that how the times have changed in many many contexts how the times have changed this would 
we are very different conversation back in 2010 and 2012 when we were in school but was you covered it beautifully and i and i what what is kind of the harsh reality is green forest rovers had kind of forest the, green krishna <laughs> forest green rovers <laughs> damn it what is fgr it's fgr it's fgr you know fgr is actually perfect i want to just stick to fgr because i think that can remember that better i'll probably mess it up to gfr somehow but forest green rovers fgr Dale Wins probably had the advantage of it being a smaller club, right? There are all these, you know, you have more control to kind of determine the pathway for this club as compared to some, like some of the bigger clubs, there are so many intricacies that are already built out. It's such a bureaucracy that breaking through it and creating your own ways is, is sometimes a little more challenging. But you know what? Like Samuel, the famous Samuel said, they've created an option. At least now you can believe that this is a thing that is possible and doable. And I think Look, at the end of the day, I think all of us have a little bit of an optimist in us. And I think we're hoping that football clubs can, even in small ways, say, okay, fine, every aspect is not going to be like FGR, where they're going to be able to, you know, make every process sustainable right off the bat. But even if one thing starts, even if, if you know, the aspect of whatever, the, the way in which the, the, the pitches are, the new pitches are being created are more sustainable, or the way in which heating is done in the, in the stadium is, is more sustainable. Even if we can start hitting away at one or two things in each club, that to me is great progress. It, it, honestly, it is exciting. It is exciting to hear news like this. But I must thank you. That was a perfect, perfect overview of this entire organization. For those of you who, um, who know anything about this club, feel free to add your own comments or any other exciting news in the world of sustainability and sports. With that, thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did like it, make sure to hit a like on this video and share it to anyone else who might like it. With that, signing off for this week, but see you next week. Just one thing, shout out, Fedo. This research belongs to you as well. So thank you for that. And shout out to Sam Green Armitage as well. Thanks to you mentioning for his green, we ended up picking up that project. So cheers, mate. <laughs> Peace. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a like and share it with anyone else who might be interested. You can also subscribe on any social media platform that you prefer and all our links are in the bio. We also have a website with all our episodes as well as blogs and a whole lot of other sports content so make sure to check that out as well.